Oh, hello, Internet. Didn't see you there. Welcome to the world-renowned review of AMC's The Terror, Episode 5, entitled First Shot of Winter Lads. I am the world-renowned historian. Uh, first of all, I want to say to everyone who watched the last two episodes and to everyone who was watching this one, thank you. I do sincerely appreciate it. I suppose I don't have to tell you all at this point that this show is the best show on television. Probably the best thing on television in a long time, probably since Breaking Bad went off the air. So I'll just stop saying that in every one of these and just get straight to the point, straight to the review. The writing is getting more intricate and many leveled, and it's actually becoming difficult to like summarize and recap and analyze without this video getting incredibly long. Like I could spend the entire recap going on about any given scene, let alone an entire episode. So you might be wondering what my clipping my nails has to do with this week's episode. Well, friendo, stick around, because from here on out, Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. So if I had to pick a major theme for this episode, it is amputation. You know, excising those parts of ourselves which no longer serve their purpose or could potentially kill us. This imagery repeats over and over in this episode, this act of cutting away. You know, we could see this as gory and tragic, and it certainly is painful, but at some point, you know, we have to make the grudging realization that it's necessary. You know, no matter what or who it is we're cutting out of our lives, be it physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, it could be a habit. You know, you can amputate a habit from yourself. If I had to choose a second theme to this episode, it's that Thomas Blanky is one stone-cold badass. So the episode's opening shot is of a watch, held in the shaking hand of a man in full slops, as the arctic wind howls in the background. It's Crozier and Charles DeVoe outside, taking measurements of the weather. You know, they're guarded by marines, and the stopwatch imagery reminds us of the urgent, time-sensitive situation that the men are under, given the monster, and given that we learned from a brief scene between Diggle and Erebus Cook in a previous episode, there may be an issue with the food stores. And, as we find out soon in this episode, Crozier is on a clock of his own. In a brief but utterly masterfully shot and edited scene, we get a cut back and forth of Captain Fitzjames counting the miles with a compass on his map down to Back's Great Fish River, interlaced with Crozier and DeVoe moving through the ship's hull. So Fitzjames is contemplating an idea that surely must seem mad at the time. And we see this intercut with the men who will have to commit to that mad idea, if they choose to do it. So Little interrupts Fitzjames, and Fitzjames points out, rather pointedly, that Crozier isn't there. And Little says that he sends his regrets. Fitzjames is deeply irritated by this, and he senses that there is something that Little isn't telling him, and Little essentially lies on Crozier's behalf, just saying that he simply has much to do over on Terror. Fitzjames insists that Little takes silence back to Terror because she's upsetting his men, and he says, you will see how. And Little does see immediately. They're leaving presents for her. So everybody, let's do a thought experiment. Let's lock 60 young men into a tiny wooden box and throw it on the ocean for literally years and then introduce an attractive woman into the mix. What do you think's gonna happen? Next, we learn that Good Sir is learning the Inictitut language from Lady Silence. Now, I don't know how much realism you demand from your language learning in TV shows and movies. You know, in my experience, and just from what I've learned from studying language myself, it's always depicted as way too fast. You know, one thing I will give them, we don't know how much time has passed between episodes, and they don't depict Good Sir as fluent, and they certainly do depict him as a very smart guy. The Inuktitut language still exists, by the way. It's spoken by about 40,000 native speakers, and in fact, about 97% of all Inuit today have some kind of proficiency with it. Anyway, Good Sir asks if he can come over to Terror with her because he's working on an Inuktitut dictionary, and Little asks him if he understands Terror's situation, that situation perhaps being Captain Crozier's alcoholism, and perhaps also the bad shape of the ship. Good Sir says that he does, and he goes along. And I do utterly love the shot of Lady Silence looking through these trinkets that the men have left her, and she simply says, Terror? Again, just such a multifaceted title. Next up, we get a scene of DeVoe's frostbitten toes being clipped off, and again, we get that imagery of amputation. And this is as Good Sir is talking about leaving Stanley, and Stanley gives him leave to do so. And we start to see Good Sir show a little backbone in this uh, wonderful exchange between the two doctors. You know, Stanley, this miserable, kind of mopey racist who hates the Eskies, tells Good Sir not to forget to invite them all to the wedding between him and Silence. You know, he's being sarcastic here. 
And Good Sir replies, Dr. Stanley, has anyone ever invited you to a wedding? And I just, I, I love seeing, you know, this, this meek sort of bookish Good Sir beginning to, to develop a little bit of a spine. Then we get Fitzjames checking the cleanliness of the men aboard his ship. You know, I think he's doing this in part in reaction to Crozier's further descent into his drunkenness. Like, Fitzjames was falling apart a little bit in previous episodes, and now he's sort of trying to get it together and keep it more together, and he's sort of back on the track of naval discipline. All part of keeping the men in line and together in a desperate situation. Part of this, interestingly, includes the nails. You know, he tells a man from terror that his nails are a terror. Keep that in mind for later. Then Collins tells Fitzjames that Crozier has requisitioned 16 bottles of liquor from his spirit room. Now look at Fitzjames. I don't think Fitzjames is very happy about that. We get the men taking silence back to Terror, and Terror is horribly tilted in the ice, which we see in this gorgeous shot. Then Mr. Hornby collapses and dies on the ice. Now this was the man that Good Sir was examining in the last episode, at the end of the last episode, and he had that line of black on uh, both sides of his gums. Now Little returns to find Crozier and Thomas Blanky in conversation, and Crozier asks him, Ah, Edward, how fares the Raft of the Medusa? Referring to Erebus. So what is the Raft of the Medusa? Well, it's this. Le Radeau de la Meduse by the French romantic painter Théodore Guéricault. It depicts the French frigate Meduse running aground off the coast of what is today Mauritania in 1816. About 150 set sail on this, uh, like, hurriedly constructed raft, and all but 15 of them drowned. Those who survived endured starvation and likely turned to cannibalism. So this is an extremely dark joke by Captain Crozier. Little reports to them that Hornby is dead and that silence has come back to terror. And it's interesting to me that how just Crozier just accepts this simply, you know, as it is technically a contravention of his orders, right? Like, it, it surely highlights the differing social standing between Crozier and Fitzjames, uh, something that will be coming to a head later in this episode. But Crozier is very worried about his dwindling supply of spirits, which he is very clearly depending on. You know, Little tells him that he could have gotten him gin, but uh, Crozier, you know, is disgusted by that thought, and he has an interesting line about how his father drank gin. Uh, you know, L Little watches his, his commander, this alcoholic, you know, dealing with his coping mechanism. You know, he watches Crozier essentially instruct him to steal from Fitzjames' private chamber. And this subtle look of disgust appears on Little's face. This is not the last time in this episode where someone will look at Crozier with a disgusted face. And this is where that clock imagery from the opening returns, as Crozier asks Dobson how much whiskey he has left in his own store, and he learns that it's two bottles. And Crozier tells Little, that is his clock. Don't let it run out. Then we get Good Sir treating Cornelius Hickey, and Hickey tries to manipulate him into telling him why silence was brought on board Terror. And Good Sir's response is, again, part of the evolution of his character. You know, he says, does that really work with anyone, Mr. Hickey? Meaning his manipulations and his, you know, attempts at, you know, getting information. You know, this may end up being a mistake, I feel, because now Hickey knows that Good Sir is not somebody who he can manipulate. But in the next scene, Good Sir asks about the line of darkness he saw in Hornby's gums in the last episode. Now, Dr. McDonald says it's not scurvy, and Good Sir says it could be bismuth, and McDonald brings up the idea of lead. The French, McDonald says, have recently proven that lead can be dangerous. I don't want to talk about the history of that just yet, because it's still a little bit too close to spoiler town. But probably after next week's episode will be the time to talk about that. Cornelius Hickey and his former lover Gibson are down in the hole. Hickey asks Gibson why the officers are so unhappy lately. He says that he can't hear what anyone above that magic line is saying unless he's up there cocking a privy, as it were. Uh, but Gibson himself is in a position to hear them. Now Gibson asks Hickey what he gets in return for this information from the officers, and Hickey gives him a ring. I don't know how I missed this in episode one, but Hickey stole that ring off the corpse from the man whose uh, coffin he was careful to fix, all the way back in episode one. Next up, we get Magnus Manson going down into the hold where they keep the bodies, and we get the scene that actually opened the book, with big dumb Magnus Manson refusing to go down to where they, they stow the corpses. Now John Irving comes down, and they argue about Manson going down to the hold. 
Manson tells Irving that he can hear Strong and Evans down there moving around. And Irving calls him a blasphemer because the Christian position is that spirits don't continue in this world. Now that's something else to remember that comes back around later. You know, Irving represents the Christian, i.e. Western idea that ghosts are not real. Anyways, there's a bit of a scuffle and Hickey comes to the rescue of Hartnell and Manson and they get Hornby's corpse moved. Next up, we get a Marine clipping the nails of the poor bastard who lost his skull to the monster. So we get our third moment of amputation imagery. You know, the first was the clipping of DeVoe's toes. The second was Dr. McDonald talking about how he didn't want another man to lose a piece of himself. And the third is this. He explains exactly why the men are firing the cannon out onto the ice in the next scene, talking to the catatonic man whose nails he is clipping. You know, this is brilliant filmmaking. You, you include the amputation imagery and you reinforce that aspect. You give the Marine this sort of uh, Shakespearean, Deadwoodian monologue to essentially an, an inanimate object in the catatonic man. You know, think uh, Hamlet talking to Yorick's skull. Think Al Swearingen in Deadwood talking to the decapitated head of the dead Indian chief. And you tell us why they are doing what they are doing in the very next scene. Just brilliant scene. And then we have probably one of my favorite sequences in all of television. Blanky, Goodsir, Crozier, and Little are there to interrogate Lady Silence. Again, I would like to give high praise to the work of Neve Nielsen here as Lady Silence. And good God, she is so great in this scene. Even just the conversation between Crozier and Goodsir before she even gets there is a masterwork of dialogue, approaching like Casablanca levels of subtext. Well, maybe not that far, but it's really good. Crozier asks her simply, bluntly, what is hunting them? And it is a massive credit to this show that it's almost an afterthought when she names it. Like, it, it doesn't get a subtitle. It's not this earth-shattering moment. I'll give it a subtitle. Toonbuck. Now, Silence won't talk about the creature, but Good Sir has gained her trust to an extent. Crozier is very dismissive of Good Sir's efforts and his uh, uh, anthropological passions. You know, Crozier offers her tea and she says no, so he doesn't drink either. Crozier asks, and she answers immediately, and we get the creature's name, the Toonbuck. The old veteran Blanky says that it is similar to a word in a different Inuit language that he knows for a, a spirit that dresses as an animal. Now, Little freaks out about this, and Crozier immediately tells him this does not leave this room. Now, I would like to contrast John Irving's extreme Christian attitude that spirits don't exist in this world with Crozier's sort of calm acceptance that it may be a spirit that's hunting them. Because he doesn't exactly laugh her out of the room, does he? Why is that? Actually, he asks her, how do we kill it? If he thought it were just a bear, he would know how to kill it. Well, based on the book material and not spoiling anything, uh, Crozier has very strong memories from his childhood as to why he might believe in spirits. You know, those indigenous Irish beliefs run deep, those pre-Christian Irish beliefs, and they do have their own distinct culture. You know, the Banshees live in Ireland. But when Crozier asks her how to kill it, her face shows nothing but disdain. We get a wonderful line from Crozier where he says that he hopes Good Sir lives to sell his dictionary, and Crozier himself hopes that he lives to buy it. Now, Crozier asks again, but he's not real patient with Good Sir's softer touch. And his frustration boils over. And essentially, he tells the men to deny Silence protection on either ship if she doesn't help them stop it. And Blanky, who is probably at the same experience level as Crozier, though Crozier is technically his superior, refuses this order, pointing out that it's clear that Silence fears the creature just as much as they do. Listen to Tom Blanky, everybody. That's the moral of this episode. And then Silence basically peers right into Crozier's soul. She says, look at you, you don't even want to live. And Crozier backs off. And Blanky translates the question. She asked, why do you want to die? Now, this is exactly the right time to translate a subtitle, just to reinforce that point, because Blanky freaking wants to know what she's talking about. Now, Fitzjames shows up and confronts Crozier about the stolen whiskey. He calls him Francis rather than Captain Crozier. And Crozier takes that, well, actually... Crozier lights into him, screams at him, you will call me what I'm due. Basically saying, okay, look, you jumped up little prissy silver spoon asshole. You were going to call me what I've been, what I've earned. You know, look at this from Crozier's point of view. This little silver spoon baby is not going to disrespect him. And Fitzjames tells him to stop being a drunk and earn respect if he wants it. This intervention completely gets Crozier to see the light. And the two men share a teary-eyed hug as Crozier promises to do better. 
No, I'm just kidding. Crozier, he, he decks him. Just lands one right on the jaw. In the brief ensuing melee, even Blanky shuts him down, telling him that the same thing that happened to John Ross will happen to Crozier. Now, I can't find what this refers to, and if somebody knows or finds it, uh, let me know in the comments or on Twitter or something, but it's a reference to their shared history. You know, remember, these were the two men standing in the rigging hundreds of feet above the ice together. You know, Blanky knows that Crozier is just lost in his cups, and he's just not in his right mind. Crozier orders everyone out. He orders Blanky, in fact, to go stare at the ice, give me a report, which is supposed to be kind of a, a sarcastic, mean thing about Blanky's uh, position, but Blanky does it. This goes poorly. He chose poorly. Pretty much the moment Blanky gets up on deck, the Toonbach attacks. Now, up on deck, there's this immediate confusion as they see their sail tents being tossed about and ripped to pieces, you know. First the creature's here, then it's there. You know, the men have a visual and instantly they lose it like that. Now Johnson below deck sees it through through one of the windows in Crozier's quarters. And we get just this immediate sense of how it just moves far faster than any natural polar bear possibly could. Now the action scene that follows is wonderful. Really the only thing I can compare it to is like the last 15 to 20 minutes of Jaws. Basically, long story short, Thomas Blanky comes face to face with the Toon Buck. But here's the thing. Thomas Blanky has been around ships his whole goddamn life. If anybody knows how to get away from this thing, it's Tom Blanky. You know, the action is shot expertly. Like, everything has gravity. You know, there's no John McClane diehard type stuff. Not that I hate diehard, but it's just a different kind of action. You know, it, it's, it's just such a perfect quintessential depiction of how less is more. Like, one thing I always go back to is my favorite shootout in movie history in No Country for Old Men, where I think, like, eight ten maybe bullets are fired really less is more so blanky leaps into the rigging and climbs for his life as he screams at the men to man the cannon the beast like rips the rigging out from under him just as he reaches the crow's nest and the score throughout the scene i should note is amazing so blanky climbs like out onto one of the masts i, I don't know the exact name of it i apologize for that as he sees uh the toonbok like climbing out behind him and he's, you know, kind of climbing out like further and further kind of toward the lantern at the end. And the beast just rips his leg wide open. Finally, the men have the cannon ready to go, but they can't see it. It's a white creature in a snowstorm, maybe 50 feet off the ground. Did I mention Tom Blanky is a stone cold badass? Blanky the badass somehow manages to light the creature on fire. I don't know if it was like an explosive or if he created like a makeshift Molotov but the point is, he gives the men on the ground a target. They didn't kill it. They can see the blood track vanishing out onto the ice. And then they find Blanky, hanging from the rigging, somehow still alive, just as Crozier sees Silence escape the boat out onto the ice. And he lets her go. So let's talk about Thomas Blanky for a minute. So, first of all, I freaking love this character in the book uh, for reasons that I won't divulge just in case there are spoilers involved. Um, you know, we don't get a ton of his point of view in the book, but the few chapters that we do get and the interaction we get with him from other characters' point of view, uh, specifically Crozier's, like, this dude freaking rules. The real-life Thomas Blanky surely was Terror's Ice Master. You know, we know that, and there, there's no reason to believe that his and Crozier's relationship was purely imagined by Simmons. They were on several of the same expeditions together. You know, both were serious veterans of the Arctic. Blanky, for instance, was on James Clark Ross's expedition to the North Magnetic Pole. It was James Clark Ross, Thomas Abernathy, three others who we don't know, and Thomas Blanky. Blanky was an OG when it came to the Arctic exploration game. You know, he probably should have and could have been a captain himself, but for whatever reason, he chose to accompany the Franklin expedition as an ice master. In short, Tom Blanky, both in the show, in the book, and in real life, is one badass mofo. Deserves a lot more love from history. First shot's a winner, lads. They get Blanky below deck, and he is a god dang mess. You know, the beast damn near tore his leg off. Stanley says they need to get him well and sloshed, and Good Sir offers to go get the booze for him. Crozier tries to get him to go bottoms up on the whiskey, but my dude Blanky says everyone gets a shot. Blanky says he feels like he got engaged with the beast, and he wants the boys to celebrate. 
Here is my reaction when I heard this. Go for it. Go for it. And then they saw off Blanky's leg. The one the Toonbot got a piece of, obviously. It's gruesome, it's disgusting, it's painful to watch, and it completely fits into the theme of this episode. Number one, Tom Blanky is a bad dude. Two, amputation. Cutting away that part of us which no longer serves us and could end up killing us. Just to recap, we saw that with DeVoe's toes. We saw it with the fingernails of the Marine with the ripped off skull. We saw it with Dr. McDonald saying he didn't want to see the men lose a piece of themselves. And now we see it with Blanky's leg. And we're about to see it with Crozier. So Crozier calls in Fitzjames, McDonald, Little, and Dobson into his personal quarters. Now the long and the short of this is, he realizes he nearly got Blanky killed because of a drunken taunt. This is his rock bottom. Now I'm not kidding when I say this is probably the greatest acted scene of Jared Harris's career. Basically, Crozier asks them to help him get clean. He tells them he will be unwell, essentially dealing with the delirium tremens. So this is our final scene of amputation in the episode. You know, this is Crozier attempting to amputate the poison from his body. There are many kinds of poison, you know, be it the dead flesh of a frostbitten toe, be it an overdependence on alcohol, be it the bitter, horrifically painful regret of lost love. For the booze has been covering the emotional pain for Crozier, and in this scene, he's amputating all the poison from his body. It's going to be horribly painful, and he's going to wish he was dead before it was over, but he has at last realized that he cannot command these men. He cannot pursue their survival unless he is willing to go through this. Ironically, Sophia asked him to go on this expedition and look out for her uncle. And now it is her memory which keeps him from being unable to do so. So Crozier amputates her, and Booze, from his life. You may have noted the lack of Sophia flashbacks in this episode. Now, Crozier has a line in this scene that is just excruciating. He's just said that Fitzjames and Little must be in control while he convalesces and, you know, gets through his addiction. And Fitzjames says, Francis. And it has, that, that word has very different content now than it did before. Now, now it's as a friend, whereas when he called him Francis before it was sort of a meant as disrespect but this time it's clearly as a, a friend and you know someone who cares but Crozier just sort of chuckles in response to it and he says I may beg you god damn he gives his gun to Little and he tells him don't give it back to me until you see me on deck again in full uniform a little callback to Fitzjames earlier in the episode harping on neatness and protocol you know even in this difficult situation so this scene does occur in the book, and it fir at first it felt too early for me in the show for it to happen. But, you know, we are at the end of the fifth episode already, out of ten. You know, time kind of flies when you're watching something awesome. Uh, we're at the literal halfway point, and if memory serves, that is basically where it happened in the book. Uh, you know, we're at the tipping point, as it were. Is, is Crozier going to come back from the brink and, like, lead these men? Or does he simply continue to descend into his, you know, haze of hatred and drunkenness and hoping to die just like lady silence said so our final scene in the episode features good sir examining the tinned food stores with that great thumping creepy soundtrack in the background now franklin's monkey wanders in and good sir somewhat creepily i'll admit tells him that he needs his help and then he feeds the monkey some of the food from the tins again i suspect we will talk about stephen goldner in the next episode all right, everybody, that's it for this week. If you reacted to my take on this episode at all, don't forget to do all that good YouTube stuff. Do the like, dislike, comment, maybe subscribe if you really enjoyed it. And until next time, this is the world-renowned historian. Be good, kiddos. I'm out. <laughs>